Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about replacing import the statement Python with Accio in the CPython source code. Um, so import or Accio is, in case you do not know, it is a Harry Potter spell. So if you have a wand in your hand and you're like Accio broomstick or something like that, and broomstick like lives in another room or like far across the ocean or something, it should fly to you and into your hand and then you can use it, right? So this kind of works like import. So import in Python, you say like import a module name and a module is like a Python script that lives far away elsewhere on your computer and it comes to you and you can use the things inside of it. So that is the connection. Um, my name is Amy Hanlon. Um, you can find me on Twitter. That is a portmanteau of amygdala and llama because reasons. And uh, that is my blog. Um, also, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Open Source Bridge, for accepting my talk. It's awesome. OK, so um, we'll cover some things, right? We'll ask some questions. Um, one is, what is import? Um, also, spoiler alert, import is a statement. So we will talk about what does it mean for something to be a statement, um, a valid statement, or like not valid. Um, we'll talk about where a statement's defined in the CPython source code. Um, and also, how would we modify a statement? Finally, this will all lead us kind of to what is a Python interpreter, although only we'll, talk, we'll only talk about like a small part of the interpreter. So first, what is import? So import allows you to import modules, like I said earlier. So you can import random. Random is the name of a module. And this gives you access to the functions and the objects that live inside the random module, like randint here. So then Python is able to execute the code that lives inside this module and give you like a result that makes sense. Um, and the way that Python does this and like executes the import statement is outside of the scope of this talk, but is also very interesting. I have a link at the end that um, is to a talk that my friend Allison gave about how um, import actually works, and it's really cool. OK, so this brings us to import is a statement. Um, so let's say, what, what is a statement, right? Um, so a statement is like a line of code in Python, or a group of lines of code in Python. And they're defined in the grammar file inside the CPython source code. And it's really easy to find the CPython, um, the grammar inside the CPython source code. So let's say you cloned the CPython source code into your computer into this directory called CPython. Um, it has some like top level directories. One of those is grammar, and it's the only file inside this grammar directory. And it contains lines of code that look like this. So this is written in extended Bacchus Nauer form, EBNF, but that is unimportant. The important part is how you would read a line of code like this. So this is the definition of an import statement. And it says an import statement is contained by, or contains an import name or an import from. And an import name is defined further on in this file. It says an import name contains the literal string import followed by this variable called dotted as names, which is kind of confusingly named, but basically it's all the different ways you could represent a module name or also like objects from that module. Um, so you could like import random dot random or something as well as just the module. That part is unimportant. So just think about that as like the name of a module. So um, the import from name, so the slide behind says import name or import from. Import from is like basically defined similarly. So how would we go about modifying this statement? So our goal is we want to be able to accio random, the name of the module. And we want it to work just like import random did. Um, so we don't want to change like the um, machinery underneath that import statement. And then when we try importing random, we want to get a syntax error. And as a side note, a syntax error occurs when there's a line of Python code the interpreter tries to read that, and it doesn't match any actual valid Python statement in, that py in the grammar file. So our strategy is going to be to modify that file. And then we compile a new Python interpreter. And I say that, like, what, what does that mean? What does compiling a Python interpreter mean? So a Python interpreter is an executable program that lives on your computer. And the way that you create it is you compile its source code. 
So we're going to compile some Python source code in order to get a Python interpreter. And by Python interpreter, like you're very familiar with what this thing is if you've written Python code, because like you file up your terminal and you type in Python and that executes the Python interpreter and then you start feeding it code and it does what you want it to do. So our first attempt at this is we'll open up this grammar file and let's just try changing that string that said import, the little string import, change it to Accio, compile and see what happens. This is kind of a naive approach, but the errors that we get will be illuminating. So we try compiling. It just says make here because a very nice human before us has created a script that basically has what is actually happening when you compile this, uh, the CPython source code in its own file called the make file. And the way that you execute all of that is just by typing make, and it's awesome. Makes it very easy for us. So when we run this make script, we get a syntax error. Um, so this means a couple things. We get the syntax error on an import statement. So number one, a Python script is being executed when we run this make script, when we're compiling Python, which is kind of weird. And the other part is it's a syntax error on import, which means we did successfully remove import. Now we don't, like, this interpreter does not know what to do when you type in import, which is good. So what do we do now? How do we fix this error? Um, so let's keep the changes that we made to the grammar file. And then let's try a much more complicated bash command that is actually this, but this is a good like sort of representation. We're going to try to find and replace all of the import statements with Accio statements in the CPython source code. So that hopefully our interpreter will be able to like understand itself. This is the goal. Um, one warning is that the actual bash command for this is like much more complicated. And when you do like crazy um, bash commands that modify your file system, um, it can be dangerous and bad things can happen. Um, so I will just leave you with that warning. Um, like don't try this at home kind of warning. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, so we try compiling again. And then the crazy part is we get another syntax error, right? And this time we get it on Accio, which is weird because the Python interpreter that we're currently compiling should be able to understand Accio, right? We made it that way. Um, so this, this is weird. Like, what's going on? So I looked at the Python script that caused this syntax error. Now, the very top of it is this line. And this is probably familiar to many of you. Basically, what it means is um, when that script is executed, it is probably using the environment Python that already lives on my computer. Um, the Python that understands import and not Accio. So this is kind of weird. Um, environment Python basically just means the first Python that your computer finds on your path. So when you type Python into your um, terminal, it's that interpreter that pops up. OK, so this seems kind of like a catch-22, right? So like. In order for us to compile a Python that understands Accio, we need one already on our computer to compile it that understands Accio. Like, and I know that makes you feel like a snake eating its own tail or something, and it probably should. Um, this is called bootstrapping. It's actually a very common thing in compilers. So we're going to try to figure out what to do with this, right? For now, maybe we should settle with not completely removing import. So I think what we can do is say, let's try making a Python that can understand both import and Accio. So the way that we can do this is back in the grammar file, we can say, OK, an import name, I'm going to let that be the literal string import followed by a module name, or the literal string Accio followed by a module name. So theoretically, this should create um, a Python in which we can use both import and Accio. So we try to compile, and we don't get any errors, which is cool. And then we fire up this interpreter, and we can Accio random, no errors. But the problem is we can still import random, and there are no errors, and then we can use this random module. So what we really want to happen is to get a syntax error on this import statement. So how do we do that? Well. The problem that occurred earlier when we tried removing import was that our environment Python that we were using didn't understand the Accio statements that we had added, right? But now we have a Python that understands Accio statements, right? Like that did not throw a syntax error. So we can try doing 
is setting that Python as our environment Python. It understands Accio. And it kind of acts like a Rosetta Stone kind of between these two Python versions. We try to use that. Okay, so let's add that Python to the front of our path so that it is the environment Python. And then we go back into the grammar file and we say, okay, an import name that's just going to be the literal string Accio now, followed by a module name. We make sure that all of the import statements are Accio statements in the source code for this Python. We compile again. We don't get any errors. And then this time, it totally works. We can Accio random. And then we can import random, and we get a syntax error, which is awesome. <laughs> And that was way shorter than I had intended, and that's basically it. But it is very like confusing, so I expect questions, and if there's a part that you do not understand, I could try to like draw things on the board to try to explain it. Um, yeah. Also, I have links, so you should check this out. Yeah. Uh, I use Python a lot, but I've never needed to compile it. So mm -hmm. It seems strange to me that um, the make process, the build process, needs yeah, right, that's really crazy. And so that's because part of the C Python source code is written in Python. And the reason that they do that is to try, I think, is to try to encourage contributors to the C Python source code. So if you get a bunch of new Python programmers, it's much easier for them to contribute to the language Python if some of it is written in Python, right? Like in some language that they're familiar with. So this is a pretty common thing. Um, it's called bootstrap compiling. And essentially what happens is the first few versions of Python would be compiled only in C, for example. And then as soon as the Python language becomes mature enough, they write um, basically a, a compiler in Python. Um, what about the libraries? I mean, they, they must be building some libraries or some purely Python libraries too, right? Right. I think some of the libraries are in C, and then a lot of them are in Python. So what happens if you try to import one of those? So if you import a language that's a pure Python library, mm -hmm. I'm sure that, that one has import in there, right? So you, those libraries would probably right. Exactly. So that's why I did the find and replace in the CPython source oh, code. Yeah. yeah. Source code. That would not work if, for example, I like pip installed right. a library, then that would all have import statements. So it's clearly not compatible with like any other like Python libraries, right? <laughs> that's not necessarily the point. It's not really supposed to be useful. Although it is one character less than import and like much <laughs> quicker to type. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but think about how many times you type yeah. in import, right? Yeah, like exactly. And the letters, the letters are closer. So not only is it a letter shorter, but they're closer on the keyboard, like much easier, like much quicker to type, even if they were the same length, I would argue. Yeah, yes? OK, so this is a good question. It's mostly C, right? It's mostly C. So I think that um, this person, Allison, that I mentioned before, who has the cool like import statement talk, also gave a talk about the um, oh like crazy long switch statement that is basically um, the interpreter from like Python bytecode. Um, so let's see. So the Python interpreter does a few things, right? So the first thing it does is take in a string of code, like tries to see if it is a valid Python statement. So the way that it starts doing that is um, tokenizing the words. So it's like, this is a word that I recognize, like it is of this type, like stuff like that, and then forms a tree. And I think, I'm not sure what language that part is in. And then after that, the compiling part is it creates bytecode. And then after that, there's another interpreter that is basically, I think, only written in C, that takes the bytecode and then like executes machine code. I think that's the way it works, but I'm like not an expert, and it's possible that someone else in here is like more of an expert than I am. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like my basic mental model of how it works, um, but it's probably like definitely like an abstraction of what really happens. Yeah. Yeah, oh man, the hardest part was figuring out um, that I had to use an intermediary Python and that I could use that. Um, yeah, that, that was crazy. 
I don't know. <laughs> it was just something that came to me. Like It wasn't like I went through a series of logical steps of thought to get to it and discover it. I think I was just lucky that an idea like flew from far away and then like came in my direction and I was able to grab onto it and use it. And has anyone else asked for a copy? Um, no, although I was, I really wanted to put it up um, like on homebrew so that people could like brew install Nagini is what I called it. So Nagini is like a snake in Python or in Harry Potter. So it totally makes sense um, so that people could brew install Nagini and screw up their computer. Um, <laughs> well, there's okay. So maybe I can show you this other stuff. So um, when I first started working on this project, I tried doing this um, a while ago and it totally broke. So we'll see if this works. But so I have Nagini here, and it fires up, and I can like Accio random, right? And one of the things, so when I started, I tried overwriting built-in functions. So a built-in function would be something like type. So you can say type of three, and then it should say int or something, like the type of that object. So um, if we do try type of three, it will tell us that it is a Slytherin object. Um, <laughs> implementing this stuff is like not nearly as hard because I can just overwrite type now and say like def type and have it take in a parameter and then have it return one or something and then now that will be the type function. Um, I also have a, a one that's much harder to type, so Wingardium Leviosa. Three, which is a Harry Potter spell where you can like lift objects up so you float them. <laughs> yeah, and it converts to float. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh wait, you can also Avada Kedavra, and then you will it will quit. Um, what else did I do? I think that might be it. There's probably others. Um, I have them all defined. So I guess I'll type Avada. I'll do it the long way. OK, so let's see where I am. Um, OK, so I have this like thing. Don't save that draft email. Um, oh, reducto. So reducto is reduce. You know, so there's also like functional programming in here. Um, and then mainly just a framework. Okay, so I think I covered basically everything. Um, yeah. Cool. Do y'all have more questions? Well, yeah. A couple. Sure. A couple of comments. One trollish and one not. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. The non-trollish one is I don't actually know what. You might have a look through the Lex and Yak programs, which, at least in the old days, when dinosaurs ruled the earth when I was young, <laughs> um, were the standard tools that people tended to use in order to take something that would have been roughly approximating the DNF format and actually turn that into some kind of C code. Yeah, cool. And that might be what C Python does. It's possible. It seems like, like that would be a, a logical choice for it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The second semi-trollish semi suggestion is, uh, in, in terms of doing the Python, the C Python bootstrapping, have you considered replacing the system Python command temporarily with a script that feeds whatever command line arguments it is to, through said or worse, the C preprocessor to, temp to mysteriously change the contents of the source code before it gets to the system C or system Python interpreter, so that the build Okay, you might have lost me. Basically, you. Lucky He's saying like hand wave your way through the bootstrapping process, yeah. right? Like stop right. In the middle. I see. So take like, take this string that says Accio random, intercept it, and change it to import random. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it, that it, probably would have maybe been easier. I don't. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> it depends on what you're trying to do. Sometimes right. Replacing binaries. Yeah. The input arguments and data to them works, and other times it turns into a whole like a 
Yeah, <laughs> that sounds fun. I think, um, so related to that, I, I worked on this project at Hacker School, and um, so I wanted to do this other kind of mischievous thing at Hacker School, but then decided to start working on more practical projects because I wanted to get a job, and people don't really pay you to like screw up like the languages that they like to use. But um, <laughs> so that's awesome. <laughs> um, so anyway, one of my ideas was to make kind of like you could go in your browser to this like website, right? And it would have a box and you start typing in Python code. And if you make a syntax error, it just starts deleting built-ins. And so you like no longer have access to that built-in. And you're just trying, you're trying to like solve like a project Euler problem or something. And then you just keep losing tools that you could have used. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I mean, it's like a magical misfire. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. On that, I just want to make a comment. There was a version of the Haskell compiler that they claimed was a bug, but that if you made an error, it would delete your source file. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just exported, like exported my path, like plopped the directory that um, that Python executable was in. Um, I think like what I technically did was created a symlink to it, such that you know when you typed Python in, you didn't have to type like python.exe or whatever, um, and it would just be found. Yeah. Uh huh. Right, totally. I can totally easily do this with a factory. I should do it with a factory. I'm going to do it with a math class. <laughs> right. Two, uh, I can trump all everyone <laughs> the whole this delete thing if you mess up. Uh huh. Thread, there's a distro of Linux that if you make any syntactical or type spelling errors on the command prompt, it just rn dash rn. Oh no. Oh no. Um. I had a friend who, um, I think he was working on some crazy homework assignment for one of his computer science classes and accidentally deleted it and then grepped his hard drive and it still existed on his hard drive somewhere. He just wrote a blog post about it recently. It's kind of interesting. Huh? I think of hackers as the same thing. Oh, it, possibly the same person. But not like, it doesn't usually work. Really? <laughs> Yeah. It's sort of like you run the RMF or RMRF commit and then immediately run the like save it command and then it might work. Yeah. So Interesting. I'm hearing is that I should not go home and like find a file that I love and RM it. <laughs> 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 It was the story of how they actually managed to get the system back. 
Yeah, um, it is largely discouraged, I think. <laughs> like, you don't really have a lot of reasons, I think, for like doing that for practical purposes. Um, so it's very common for like you'll see somebody um, like a new Python programmer who will be defining a variable or something, and you'll see them you know post a question on Stack Overflow, and it'll say like type equals like you know, Boolean, or so, I don't know, like they somehow want to store like the data type of a thing or like the category of it, like type equals cat, even something like that. And um, they will be criticized for doing that because you're not supposed to shadow these things because you get no error from doing that. Um, but it is like, right, it's legitimate syntax, exactly. Clearly you meant to do that, um, overwrite a thing that is useful. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, sometimes those disasters come to us. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think, I may be completely misremembering it, I think the term monkey patching for that is actually borrowed from the Python community. For you can do it, but there's a very strongly enforced cultural norm of right. just don't do this unless you really need to. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or you really want to because yeah. you want to sort things into Hogwarts houses. Um, yeah. One of the things that I did when I worked on this project is, um, so when I ran that crazy sed command, um, it was replacing or modifying these files like in, in place in my file system. And I had a git direct, like I had a git repository to back up all the stuff that I was doing. It wasn't completely necessary because I was just changing like one line at a time, you know, like the largest modification I made was like adding two lines of the grammar file or something, like, right? Um, but when I, so when I ran that sed command, I was like about to press enter and I was really scared because it was going to ruin everything and the person that I was pair programming with was like, it's fine, we have git, like we can just revert changes if we screw everything up. So I did it and it uh, corrupted the git repository and so I couldn't revert, oh, revert wow. changes. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, so that is the cautionary tale about, um, you know crazy bash scripts that you don't understand that you possibly could have gotten wrong and like didn't, you know, ignore something important like your .git directory and that same, yeah. Uh, I find it really, really helpful when running scary commands like that to press home, type echo, space, and then hit enter and see what, it, see what the command line will turn into and if you see several pages of scrolling code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Maybe the discussion is fun. Yes. I was going to say plenty of people who are fun. Yeah. Um, school, like, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. So hacker school is a very magical place. Um, <laughs> it, no, it really, really is. So basically, it's like, I think often it gets kind of coupled in with like other boot camp, like web development boot camps and stuff, but it's very much not that. Um, for example, you can work on projects like what I just showed you at hacker school, and like nobody looks at you weird. They're like, awesome, keep doing that. Um, so hacker school is a place, you go there for three months, um, four days a week, it's free. It's in New York, um, and you have to go to New York to do it. Um, they offer grants for women programmers or those who identify as women programmers. Um, I think I think they want to try, maybe, well, I don't know. These are things I should probably not say in public. Um, so um, that's just to help with like, you know, moving to one of the mo most expensive cities in the country, right? Um, so you go there for three months. There is not much structure. The only structure is you have check-ins in the morning um, where you're like, I think I want to work on this thing. And then you like talk about maybe if you like had trouble with something that you worked on the other day. And it's mainly to meet people, and that's about it. And like give yourself some structure. Like I find myself a lot more productive if in, the, in the morning. I'm like, I'm going to work on this thing today. And then that's what you try to do. And maybe you won't do it, and other exciting things will happen, but it's a little bit more um, easier for me. But that is a detail. So hacker school, you basically get to go. It's almost like you're in a co-working space with other people who have like dedicated like their time to be there, and they're going to be there four days a week for three months with you. Um, and you get to work on whatever you want, basically, as long as you are working towards becoming a better programmer. So you get to decide what that means for you and like what the best way, what the best things that you can work on to try to be there. So if you wanted to do tutorials, you can do tutorials. If you want to build this crazy like web app, you can build a crazy web app. Um, if you want to make a Harry Potter themed Python, you can do that. Um, you can kind of just do whatever. And if you need more guidance, there are people who are full-time employees who are there. Um, who you can ask, and they have lots of really great ideas for projects that you could work on um, and things you can do to get to be a better programmer. Um, they admit people who are already doing programming, so it's not completely from the ground up like a, a beginner's program. And often people um, who are pretty far along in their like software engineering um, career go as like a break, kind of like a sabbatical where they get to just go like contribute to open source projects or work on cool projects that they thought of. Is there only one of these Yes, there's only one of these places. There's only one hacker school. There are other like boot camps and um, other things. Often the other places like cost money to go and stuff like that. Um, Yes, it's something that you do yourself. Um, they do, the people who work there like will probably try to help you. Often there are hacker schooler um, alums who live in New York who like have a spot open or like maybe they're moving out of their apartment. And so there's often like leads for housing, but it's not officially provided by any means. Yeah, I think the best part about it is that all of a sudden you get to become part of this crazy alum network that's super active, and like we have, you know, this mes messaging client, and if you have a bug or something, you can like post about it on the messaging client. And then people who are experts will come and save you and like talk you through your problem, and um, it's really fun. Yeah. There are kind of spontaneous classes, like you could put on a session of something that you know a lot about if you wanted to. Um, there are talks on Thursdays, so if you made something or learned something cool that you wanted to talk about, you could do that for you know five minutes or something Thursday afternoon. Um, it's a really cool place. If you have like more questions or are wondering if it's good for you, like feel free to come up and find me later. Or there's also other hacker schoolers who are walking around too. Awesome, thank you.